spread the ideas over the labels. It doesn't really matter the labels at the end of the day if you're out there actually creating change. The point is to save lives and to create a more just world. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. And so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 25th episode of the show. And before we begin, here's your economic insight of the month. Coordination Problems A coordination game describes a situation where two or more parties will be better off if they converge or coordinate around the same strategy. For example, imagine that you and your friend lost track of each other while hanging out in the city. One way to meet up might be to text or call them, but what if your cell phone is dead? Then you and your friend face a coordination problem. You would both be better off if you wind up in the same place. So you might try to think of a focal point such as a landmark and attempt to meet up there. Here's another example. Which side of the road should you drive on? If everyone drives on the right side of the road, we'll avoid collisions. Or if everyone drives on the left side of the road, we'll avoid collisions. But if some people drive on the left while others drive on the right, they'll crash into each other. Coordination begins peaceful travel, while discoordination brings crashes, chaos, and death. Having a widely understood norm helps us coordinate so we don't crash into each other. Protest movements also face coordination problems. Imagine that engaging in a form of political action is costly. However, if enough people do it, they'll achieve a political goal, and they'll create extra benefits for those who participated in the protest. If enough people join the movement or action, it's in your interest to join too. But if not enough people join, then you'll face the costs, i.e. wasted time, arrests, retaliation, etc., without any benefit. This is a particular type of coordination game called an assurance game. If potential activists can be assured that others plan to participate, then it will be worth their while to participate. If they can't be assured, then it won't be. Successful coordination depends on people's expectations about other people's knowledge, beliefs, plans, and actions. If people have shared expectations, beliefs, and norms, they can coordinate with one another based on that. This insight was brought to you by Nathan Goodman. For the first installment of 2021, we'll be chatting with a prolific writer and activist whose ideas are as eclectic as they are thought-provoking. And today we'll be highlighting a few of her interests, including agorism, environmentalism, problems with the criminal justice system, and how we might go about building a better one. We also talk about the intentional queer community she's building, the exciting event she's planning, and the unfortunate legal situation she currently finds herself in. Without further ado, here's my interview with Logan Marie Glitterbaum. Logan Marie Glitterbaum is a writer, red tuber, and podcaster under the branding of Green Market Agorist. She's a fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society, an agorist, and an anarchist without adjectives. She's also a gun rights activist, a hardcore police and prison abolitionist, a longtime member of the Industrial Workers of the World, a dues-paying member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and a co-founder of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party. She has lived collectively for a number of years, making her living as an agorist and a freelancer, while dedicating her free time towards community organizing. Logan Marie Glitterbaum, welcome to the show. Hi. Before we start the interview, I wanted to address the the legal situation that you were in. If you don't mind, can you explain to the audience what's going on with that? 
Oh, yeah, I currently have a felony warrant out for my arrest. It was a really fun story involving a friend of mine from high school who unfortunately was shot by the police, I believe, eight times. He was armed. There was an altercation. It was a mess. Anyways, went to his funeral with a friend. We got attacked by a bunch of people at the funeral for the fact that I was wearing a Black Lives Matter mask. And I ended up having to brandish my pistol, you know, to get them to back off from me and my friend so that we could get in the truck and get away. So now I am raising money for a lawyer and I'm going to fight that shit. So, yeah. Mm hmm. Do you know what group was actually targeting y'all? Like, who was it that showed up? Was it just random reactionaries or, or was it a, a certain group? Dustin was part of a group called St. Augustine Patriots. He was one of their spokespeople. I knew him from way back before that hard turn. I remember his emo face from high school. And, you know, I love the kid because he helped me out in high school when I ran away and shit. Found me places, found me like a place to stay and shit. But his politics kind of got pretty cringe towards the end. And I mean, always, he was a country boy. And it was funny, even during his emo phase, he looked stereotypical emo kid, had the thick country accent still. But, you know, lots of rebel flags and, you know, Gadsden flags and American flags and stuff like that. And they were, you know, a bunch of flag bearers standing throughout the service. And I mean, it was a beautiful service in general. And I don't know, like, I didn't have any issues, but apparently they had issues with my mask. So, mm. so he already was sort of around this crowd who would take issues with your Black Lives Matter mask. And then they confronted you. And then in order to escape, you, you know, don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble. But I just am trying to paint the picture here. But in order to escape, you sort of had to, to brandish your firearm in order to successfully get away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that happened. It was a significant amount of the people from a funeral, surprisingly. So that's that's horrible. I'm sorry that you had to deal with that. And I'm glad that you're able to get away. I mean, where should folks go to support you and your legal expenses? Um, we have a GoFundMe that Center for Estateless Society actually was really kind enough to set up. Some of my coworkers there, especially, I mean, Alex McHugh, shout out. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody at there who has donated money to me. And thank you to everyone else who has donated money to that GoFundMe. I can send you that. Maybe we could put it in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope you're I hope you're dealing with this all right, too. I'm sure that can't be easy emotionally going through all this shit right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's something because with the um, charges they're trying to stick me with, I mean, it's a misdemeanor and a felony charge, and on the felony charge, I mean, maximum is, I think it was $5,000 or five years in prison. Jesus. And, you know, that's the maximum. I'm not sure as far as I couldn't find anything on a minimum, so apparently there's no mandatory minimums on gun laws in Florida. Which, you know, thank God on that, I guess. Yeah. Well, that, that's uh, that's dark. And everyone who is an advocate uh, for gun rights or is interested in supporting trans people or activists or anarchists who are out there doing good work, you need to go visit How to Donate to uh, Logan Marie Glitterbombs. It's not go fund me. It's go get funding. That's right. But I'll send it so you can put it in the show notes you got it will do all right so on not such a dark note you have a pretty exciting online event coming up called coup de gras 2 uh, why don't you tell the audience all about the important details with that yes coup de gras 2 electric luau here let's start a little further back we have a land project that we have been working on and it is had some setbacks lately, but, you know, we're still marching forward slowly but surely. And 
So that was called coup de main, or is called coup de main, which means lend a ham. It's Cajun French. And it was originally the idea was to host a Mardi Gras event to fundraise for the land project, which is exactly what we ended up doing earlier this year with the first coup de gras. And this is, you know, become our yearly Mardi Gras festival, and we hope to keep it going. And so we called our Mardi Gras crew, since our land project is coup de main, we're crew de main, and then our Mardi Gras event is coup de gras. Last coup de gras, we had a lot of different discussions on prison abolition and, you know, other anarchist topics, anti-fascism, cryptocurrency. It was an interesting time, especially roaming the streets of New Orleans on Lundi Gras and Mardi Gras with Vermin Supreme. <laughs> um, and it was just an all-around fun time, honestly. And we wanted to replicate that as much as possible this time, but we want everyone to be safe. And also we're dealing with a lot of restrictions and stuff like that as well, both government restrictions and, you know, financial restrictions at this point between, you know, my legal case and just general pandemic lag as far as freelance work and just work in general for a lot of people. Like most of us involved ain't got as much. So we are doing it online and we are doing it from February 12th to 16th, the 12th, 13th, and 14th on that Saturday or that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday will be basically your traditional anarchist book fair. I, I, I suggested that we model it very much on the NYC anarchist book fair, how they did it this year. And so I think that's pretty much what we're going to do. We might try and find a better platform than Zoom that will fit that capacity. I mean, it would be nice if Jitsi did or something. I don't know enough about how to set up Agora, but if anyone knows how to use that and if it would have decent capacity comparable to Zoom, you know, reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to, I'm trying to think of the email address, kudegra at riseup.net. Who all is lined up to speak at the event so far? I mean, we seem to have a pretty good lineup of people who have shown interest and who have confirmed. You have said that you have interest in hosting a panel. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting. I can't wait to see what comes of that. I know a number of other podcasters are doing episodes of their podcast. James Weeks is going to do an episode of Podcast Titles are a Spook and is also going to strip in our burlesque show. <laughs> and um uh, you know so the sequel to orlando finally will happen at coup de Gras. so come out there you go who else do we have we have the surfs are gonna possibly be doing a podcast i'm going to be doing an episode of my podcast the green market agorist yeah Bo of the fifth column Ford Fisher has said he's in. I don't know if you know news to share. Ford Fisher does a lot of the raw footage of various protests, and a lot of his footage gets reused by other news sources. He doesn't provide commentary at all. He just goes and videotapes everything. So it's, it's pretty good. And he was out there with us in Stone Mountain when we showed up to March against a clan rally that thankfully never happened. Aaron from Reeducation has said he might come. Derek Rose keeps expressing interest and in them dropping out of communication. Um, 
but it'll be fun. And there or anybody can actually host their own panel. Um, go to the website, agorafest.wordpress.com, A G O R A F E S T dot wordpress.com and you can apply on there and you can you know host a panel on anything you think is relevant honestly like it's not an exclusive thing this is just a bunch of anarchists getting together and then on lundi gras is an open mic art day so everybody show up and share your art um whether it be music dance you know, poetry, drawing, painting, sculpting, whatever. Read some prose you've written, like anything. So that's Monday, Monday you're off. And then the 16th, Tuesday, Mardi Gras day, the last day, we are doing a cabaret in lieu of a Mardi Gras ball. It'll be a lot of fun. We have some awesome comedians including jake flores who some of y'all may have seen on comedy central and a few other places he also hosts the pod damn america podcast and is just you know an all-around cool dude and my friend joey might also be rounding up some other folks from uh comedy for lizard people and other connections and uh, it'll be great like i i absolutely am excited we have different musicians we have a solar punk like edm musician who is a youtuber known as solar punk farmer who will also be doing a panel but is doing a set as inject we have evan greer the folk musician we, we've got a few We've got a few musicians and some burlesque dancers and, you know, we're hoping to really make it a blast. We're going to crown our Mardi Gras royalty. And if you're questioning why an anarchist festival would crown royalty, I don't fucking know either, but it's an anarchist tradition and we're going to mock it. So it's going to be great. Every crew crowns their royalty. <laughs> so... So is there anything else that you'd like to um, mention about the event before we uh, get into some of the questions I have for you as it relates to agorism and the rest? Anybody would like to sponsor the event, you know, and help fund it so we can pay some of the artists you can contact us on our website. If anybody wants to contribute to the cabaret in any way, or, you know, make sure they have a spot reserved for the Open Mic Art Show or host a panel over the weekend, which panels can be, you know, discussions, debates, you know, they could be skill shares, workshops, podcasts, film showings, like anything you find relevant. And just contact us on our website, agorafest.wordpress.com. And it'll be awesome. Come check it out. All right. So moving forward, I've read most of your articles on agorism and I have some questions prepared for that. But before we get into that, I want to I want to give my own definition of agorism and see if you have anything to add or object to what I say. And I should also refer the listeners to the eighth episode of the Non-Serving Podcast featuring Jack Shimmick, where we actually dedicated an entire conversation to the topic. Okay, so this is the way I'd like to explain it and, and, and let me know what you think. So just as David Graeber said that anarchy is something we do, so did Samuel Edward Konkin III, who founded the idea of agorism, say that libertarianism was something that we do, and it exists in the real world through the practice of counter-economics. And counter-economics can be defined as all actions done in defiance of the state, or done outside of the state's purview. And the idea is basically that gray and black markets or commerce that takes place outside of the formal white economy would eventually grow large enough to be able to sustain and defend itself, bringing about the agora 
or a stateless society that uses markets freed from capitalist domination as the new norm by which we relate to one another. What do you think about that explanation, Logan? I think that's a beautiful definition, honestly. Um, You know, I think the only thing I would maybe add to it is not just the state, but corporate power. Mm. But I think Comkin inherently understood that and even, you know, talked about that a lot in his literature on agorism. Mm -hmm. Um, And he saw that as an extension of statism in a lot of ways because of the various subsidies and other favorable regulations and whatnot. All right. So getting to some of your work, you've written articles distinguishing horizontal and vertical agorism, as well as the possibility of white market agorism. Can you unpack what all that means, please? So horizontal agorism is basically what a lot of people understand as agorism in the way that Konkin talked about it. That is... You know, your gray and black market activities that tend to be more outside the state in that way. But then with vertical agorism, you have the participation and building of community exchange networks, urban farming, backyard gardening, just community gardening in general, support for alternatives to the police just decentralized peer-to-peer technology and a drive towards localism in that way. You know, that's very much the Carl Hess approach in community technology and neighborhood power and a lot of his actions in real life that those books were talking about. And that's very much been a part of the agorist tradition in a lot of ways. And I don't discount that. And when I talk about white market agorism, it's some of those things that aren't necessarily illegal, you know, even green market illegal. Like you could shop at a farmer's market or, you know, do all that. Now, is it even more agorist if you don't pay taxes on it or don't report it? Yeah. Is it even more agorist if you do it in cryptocurrency? Yeah, sure. You can always get more agorist. You can always be holier than thou, but like, you know, and like, I get it. Like, it's, and that's something to strive for. It's not to the level that everybody's at, but just shopping at that farmer's market, just going to that community garden and participating in it, those type of things are absolutely part of it, setting up, you know, community maker spaces and hacker spaces and community tool sheds and, you know, community libraries for different useful things. And those type of local projects, that type of, you know, true sharing economy that really cut down on the waste and give us more access locally to produce our own stuff. So we're not relying on corporate state power. And not all of that is gray and black market necessarily, because how many agorists consider, you know, every other damn thing happening in cryptocurrency agorist, even if they're following all the laws? That's what I consider white market agorism. Got it. And and above ground companies that aid the counter economy also, I think you pointed out in one of your articles too, right? Yeah, and I mean, Konkin very much recognized that. He just never pointed out that that was the white market, and therefore that contradicted his idea that agorism is solely black and gray market. And when I talk about vertical and horizontal agorism, I got to be clear, like, that's not something I came up with by any means. It's like David Bros and all that. All right. And one thing that you're doing that I think is an example of vertical agorism is the the intentional queer community that you're creating, the land project, that is. Can you tell us what that's all about and also what inspired you to try to start it? So Kudamain was because a friend of mine came into some land and we wanted to turn it into a collective little community. I used to live on a farm out in a main somewhere, and um, it was beautiful. It was a bunch of farm punks and, 
you know, they're all listen to, you know, metal and country and hip hop and whatever and like dressing like, you know, redneck punk kids. And, you know, we had like, forget how many acres over there, but it was like 20 acres or whatever. And there was a bunch of different houses and there was a little lake that you can jump into and swim in. That shit was fun. And every once in a while they get a gator out there, but then they'd wrestle it and, you know, go throw it back in the bayou across the train tracks. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it was just a lot of fun. And, you know, we'd be out there shooting all the time and... Um, I lived in like the big, you know, main house that was all made out of like reclaimed wood from the local college and a few other places. And it was, there was no AC or, you know, central heating. It was just an open air house that you could, you know, I mean, you could shut it in the winter, but like you just opened everything up and let the breeze come in during the summer and stuff. And then the few days of winter in the South, you just turn on the actual heater, you know, put some wood on the actual wood heater and heat up the house that way after you close it up. Like, it was beautiful. We had, like, two gardens and chickens and a bunch of stuff. Like, I love that place. And it's still going on, but I'm just not living there anymore. I've lived in punk houses all my, you know, like pretty much since I moved out of my parents. And, you know, I've either been squatting or living in punk houses with a bunch of people where we all just like pile a ton of people in and pay rent and we fucking make the, you know, the coolest fucking shit we can out of it. And that kind of collective living, I just love. So we wanted to model it off of that and some of the other land projects that you hear about and see. So that's what we decided to do is turn this into that. Now, they ran into some landlord troubles. So we are looking at other properties. And this festival was actually supposed to be a fundraiser for that. And still will be, depending on how things go. But... Now taking precedent is helping get my legal fees in order. So I was convinced to let them prioritize my fundraiser. So whatever's left over from that will go towards the land project. And, you know, either way, we're continuing the land project. Either way, we have a fundraiser going for it. So it'll be awesome. And we have floated the idea of turning the cabaret into a cabaret slash telethon type deal (laughs) with the fundraiser Uh, just to see what happens and uh when you figure out who our host is it'll be interesting i don't know i'm I'm definitely excited so yeah i mean either way we're going to get coup de main off the ground we're going to turn it into a community you know we'll get a piece of property build a decent few little places to live and stuff and pile a bunch of people in there and make sure people are taken care of. Mm -hmm. And this is specifically meant for marginalized folks, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a queer and homeless community. am, Am I right? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's people who really need a space in general. It, so yeah, I mean, it's people who could benefit from much cheaper space because the idea is that we would own the property and only be paying property tax and stuff or and then sharing all the property, you know, and if we have to do rent to own or whatever, or until then save up, then we'll figure it out. But yeah, when we split the cost that way, it'll be much cheaper. And if we get enough land, like we can put a decent bit of housing on there if we do it right. We just have to figure out the zoning laws and all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that project. I mean, it sounds productive, exciting, and yeah, I mean, good luck with all that. Um, In an article you wrote called Towards an Agorist Syndicalist Alliance, you suggest that agorist tactics and syndicalist labor organizing might complement one another. There is a neat little bit where you explain how an existing Agora with allies could support labor organizers who are at risk of losing their income due to their organizing, and how syndicates could just sort of gray market their newly cooperatized firms and sort of a mutual aid situation. Um, 
I don't know if that was a good explanation of what you were trying to explain there, but could, could you sort of expound on what you were getting at with that? Yeah, yeah, no, um, that summed it up well. I would say that syndicalism has always been part of agorism. I mean, Konkin shouted out the industrial workers of the world on multiple occasions and talked about anarcho-syndicalism and said that unions were part of the free market, you know, as long as they didn't cooperate with the state, you know, that a lot of business unions and stuff were not, but that the IWW and models like that were very much the model of a free market union. So syndicalism, in a way, is part of agorism and always has been. And coming from a background of getting into anarchist organizing through the IWW, and I'm still a proud union member nearly a decade later, and it really drew me to it in the fact that it saw that as something that was counter-economic in nature. Because it's fighting against both corporate power and state power. And Konkin also saw bosses as a holdover from feudalism that was propped up by statism. Yeah, yeah. So on that front, the IWW fighting against bosses in general, no matter you know how much the business is otherwise subsidized by the state, like the boss-employee relationship is subsidized by the state. So fighting against that, is pretty agorist. I think it complements it really well, but a lot of people, mainly because a lot of people who identify as agorists seem to lean more in cap, mm -hmm. a lot of people just ignore the syndicalist aspect of it. And I really wanted to wring that out more and point that out more. And I do believe that in an, in an agorist mutualist or an agorist syndicalist alliance, I mean, because the biggest fear in union organizing is losing your job. Because even though it's illegal to be fired for, organ for union organizing, it doesn't matter. They can just make up another excuse. And so it, it becomes a thing where you just you're risking shit and union organizers get fired all the time. I mean, you saw it where, what was it, one of the execs of Amazon quit because union organizers were fired, <laughs> you know, and there's all kinds of high-profile cases. And that is one of the number one impediments to actually being able to successfully push people towards organizing in their workplace, especially when you're doing it in the style that the IWW and other anarchist and labor unions do it, where you don't have union bosses or, you know, third parties between you and your boss. Mm -hmm. We teach everyone how to organize their own workplaces, however they see fit, because who the hell knows how best to organize your workplace than you? Mm -hmm. And we organize all workers, even the unemployed. You know, the only disqualifications is you can't be a cop and you can't be a boss. Uh, and having agorist businesses and shit set up where people are, you know, selling unlicensed goods, be they, you know, otherwise legal goods, you know, thus gray market stuff, or, you know, services like lawn care and not reporting that or getting paid under the table by various businesses. I mean, I've had family who's gotten paid under the table doing like lawn shop work and construction and things like that. You know, there's, there's all kinds of shit you can do. I mean, I've done house cleaning under the table. Like those are not really risky at all like that's not a risky thing to do mm -hmm. if you can encourage folks to or if you can make it to where it's less risky to engage in attempting to have a more dignified workplace i.e a safety net and the agora or whatever then you might you might have you know some wins within the formal economy so i can see how that would work in sort of a synergistic way you know, to use a corny word, uh, that would be really promising. Well, free marketers always talk about how you could just get another job, like it's so damn easy. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, you, you had the few libertarians on the right, like, or more on the right. I mean, Conkin's really on the left, and so was Carl Hess, but still going to use them as my examples of, like, they embrace syndicalism as an option as well. 
but both are impeded by the fact that our very source of survival is wrapped up in having a job like that. And that they set it up so that we are at a disadvantage and we have to compete for jobs. There's not enough labor to go around. If you look at, you know, David Graeber's concept of bullshit jobs and you look at the fact that we overproduce and don't actually distribute well, we don't need to be doing nearly as much labor as we do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you you wrote an article on your take on the whole bullshit job situation. I definitely want to get around to that a little later in our conversation. There's actually a listener question that I'd like you to address. But back to agorism real quick. One of the reasons Konkin rejected electoral politics is because of the inherent coordination problems that necessarily come with it. And Roderick T. Long pointed out in his new YouTube channel that people who encourage non-voting ultimately suffer from the same problem. Can the same be said about agorism since it requires mass numbers of people to engage in counter-economic activity in order to get the ball rolling on Konkin's hope for a market anarchist revolution? Well, it's interesting because... I see a lot of agorist action happening in the anarchist community, even by those who don't even know the term agorism. I feel that agorism as a term kind of is a summary of a few different anarchist tactics and how they work together in a blueprint for how we can achieve things. It's a mix of illegalism and, you know, mutualist like market economics, like Rothbardian, left Rothbardian stuff, Austrian economics. But it's a mix of illegalism, syndicalism, market anarchism, and just a bunch of other similar tendencies. So you find, especially with the anarchist practice of dual power, creating alternative structures to current power structures for things that, you know, are needed or filling in the gaps in you know, these ways that challenge state and corporate power. So a lot of things that anarchists already do, like the IWW or Food Not Bombs, or, you know, right now with a lot of the stuff happening with Black Lives Matter and the defund the police movement, or, you know, anti-fascists protecting their communities. And, you know, there are all kinds of examples of people already doing this. So I don't think it's a matter of necessarily because we don't really care about labels as much of winning people over to agorism in general, but if we win up people over to anarchist ideas, to libertarian socialist ideas, to, you know, post-capitalist ideas, we can push forward. Right. Something that I've been thinking about recently is what it requires to have a revolution or what it requires to deal with these coordination issues. And one response to that is the spontaneous and particular nature of markets are in and of themselves a solution to these issues. But still, it seems to me that it seems to me that it relies on a large number of people acting in a way that he prefers. And therein is the problem because it might not always be in someone's interest to engage in risky behavior. And, you know, thus Konkin's popular hopes, at least potentially, suffer from the problem of being able to sort of kickstart the revolution. Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, there's no panacea. So, I mean, I'm definitely not saying markets by any means are the damn solution. Like, in many ways, I think we need to progress past markets. But I also don't see them as disappearing. And I think they keep anarcho-communism and other tendencies in check. Not that I'm against it. Actually, I very much lean towards anarcho-communism in many ways. But, you know, it's like Malatesta said, you know, about uh, impose communism being tyrannical if you don't have the ability to choose other economic arrangements, including mutualism and collectivism, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that, yeah, the free market in that sense keeps other tendencies in check. But I also think we should very much progress past the market as much as we can. As far as like people 
not being willing to engage in agorism because they don't want to engage in risky behavior. I mean, I addressed that earlier. There's, you know, I don't think agorism entails risky behavior necessarily. Yeah, that's fair. I think that the more people that are willing to take those risks, the more we are able to push things. I mean, you see that with drug decriminalization and legalization. You know, you see that with the movements that are trying to push for, you know, sex work decriminalization and gun rights and different things like that. Like, there are ways that we can make this work. Okay, so we do a little shtick in these interviews where I'll ask someone to explain how one might go about acquiring a cappuccino in their imagined political utopia. And I want to ask you that later, too. But I bring that up because the last interview we did with Peter Gelderlose, he gave a pretty interesting answer to that question. And one of the things that he emphasized in his answer was that his utopia would include a great deal of respect and love for the planet, which for him meant that it may be difficult to acquire coffee in places where it's not locally grown and that coffee won't be a consumer product that trumps the survival and dignity of people on the planet. And just to add to that real quick, I think most people view advocates of free markets as not being particularly concerned with environmental degradation. Yet you have, to some extent, sort of centered your political identity around advocating for markets and environmentalism. Do markets incentivize environmental destruction? And how can we have them without destroying the planet? I don't know if I'd say I, I, I've centered it around advocating markets. Um, definitely agorism. And I mean, yeah, C4SS is a market anarchist think tank. I'm more apathetic to markets. Um, anyway, as to whether markets incentivize environmentalism, I mean, I think markets incentivize whatever the hell society wants, um, whatever the hell profits most. And, you know, to some extent, that profit comes from just being able to drive down costs by any means, which means cutting corners and, you know, committing these acts of pollution and other things that actually increase environmental damage and degradation. But at the same time, the other end of that is consumer pressure. And I mean, it's not anything perfect, but I mean, we're talking about consumer advocacy organizations and, you know, we're talking about unions. We're talking about the typical free market response of, oh, then you wouldn't have the state protecting polluters so you can actually take them and hold them accountable in whatever justice system we build, you know, because they're polluting commons, um, you know, the air and, and the water and things like that that we all have to share. So I think that there are ways to push markets. Especially if we push towards like a circular economy, a sharing economy, and if we push away from markets in general, honestly. But there are ways to incentivize it. And people forget that free market environmentalism is not just suing corporations or businesses, because most corporations wouldn't exist in a free market. But, you know, not pursuing businesses and individuals, but also things like what Earth First and the Water Protectors and, you know, Earth Liberation Front and the Animal Liberation Front and other groups like that do, where they take direct action to stop some of these businesses and other groups from committing the acts they do against the Earth and its inhabitants. Right, right. And for the record, I don't mean to box you in as someone who's only concerned with markets, by the way. It's just with the, you know, the, the green market agorist and everything, there is an emphasis on that sometimes. And that's the only reason I um, bring it back to that. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I get it. I get it. And I mean, that's less an emphasis on markets in general and more of an emphasis on as long as we have markets and considering agorism is a market tactic for a you know country that has market economics as its primary form of economics like i wanted to shift the focus to green markets a little bit but i don't really give a shit one way or the other about markets in general but i'm not against them by any means okay i'd like to continue down that path of inquiry if you don't mind just because i, I think it's interesting to talk about there's something to be said about the power of culture. You know, like Etienne de la Poitie says, like, it's not that the people don't have the ability to overthrow the state, but it's that a lot of them don't want to, right? 
And so culture is obviously an important part of a healthy environment, right? And I think within any anarchist system that anyone advocates, you're going to have a hard time getting around the importance and the need for a strong culture that values a green world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think most people value a green world to some degree. You know, even the most right wing so called anti environmentalist, you know, the hunter fisher Republican type, like still doesn't want to see his favorite fishing spot get polluted, doesn't want to see the wilderness they go hunting get messed up. In fact, hunting in a lot of areas and the permits and the fees and stuff like that associated with it go to fund animal conservation projects. And, you know, that same model can and has been privatized in many areas as well. You know, I think there are ways to, you know, incentivize that. But also, I think everyone inherently wants to see their environment look well. I think a lot of people are disincentivized. And I think a lot more, you know, mutual aid and direct action groups should spring up around things if police and stuff weren't threatening people (laughs) with potential slavery or, or extortion. And, you know, people will go fix potholes, people will go make speed bumps, people, will, you know, do stuff that needs to be done. You've expressed critical support for the Green New Deal. Some radical environmentalists are skeptical of it and see it as an insufficient band-aid at best and a handout for moneyed interests and green capitalism at worst. What's your response to, to this cynical take? I completely agree with those takes. I don't really know that I've expressed too much support for the Green New Deal. Um, Maybe I should reword that. In the article you wrote, you're saying that it's not inconsistent or radically irrational to show support towards it as a libertarian. No, and I mean, I don't think it is. I think it needs to go a lot further, and it really is misguided in a lot of ways, but in lieu of their current state of actions, which is essentially fucking nothing. I'll take it. But I mean, I'm not really interested or invested in the fight for it necessarily, but also I'm not going to fight against it. You know, I mean, I really, I do like some of the ideas of public banking and public transportation and investing in renewable energies and things like that. I absolutely despise the idea of any sort of federal jobs guarantee, which not everyone who supports the Green New Deal supports that, but a lot of them do, and a lot of versions do. I'm really sad that the Democrat version of the bill doesn't include what the Green Party version included, which was cut the military budget by like 50%. But I do really like the promotion of public banking because it's a way for the state to make money and use it for the environmental projects that doesn't come from taxes and theft, you know? But I mean, at the end of the day, I'm an anarchist, but the state exists and environmentalism is important. So in, in general, I mean, your position is that we need something more radical, obviously. We need something like green agorism in order to turn things around. What what all would that entail? Well, I mean, green market agorism, that idea came about from, well, I just discovered what green markets were, and I was surprised that I hadn't really heard about that before in economic theory. And I was really surprised, considering all my readings on agorism and all their obsession with all the different colored markets. I never heard a peep about green markets within their stuff. And for those who aren't familiar, the green market is the market for reused, refurbished, you know, secondhand goods, thrift stores, flea markets, you know, secondhand shops and repair shops and refurbished shops and people who repair and repurpose shit and that type of stuff. The right to repair movement, you know, those type of things. Anything that's about reusing and those type of industries really help lower waste. I mean, that's not all we need for environmentalism. It's a big 
contributor towards getting ourselves closer to the circular economy and a greener economy. All right, cool. As we mentioned earlier, not everything we've been discussing are illegal ideas, but some of them are. And that, of course, brings us very smoothly into our next topic of discussion, which will be about what's wrong with the criminal justice system and what can be done about it. You've written quite a bit about this. And in fact, you used to be a publisher of the queer anarchist zine Pink and Black. And you also used to be the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee liaison for your old branch of the Industrial Workers of the World. So you're no stranger to these issues. What got you interested in the topic? Our zine, while sharing the same colors, is not the same as Black and Pink, the organization. Right. I very much admire their work. I have done, you know, some pen pal stuff with them. So, you know, shout out to them. But uh, our names are the reverse of each other. But both picked the colors of the anarcho-queer flag. All right. But yeah, what got you interested in, in all this? I mean, honestly, I grew up in a family that was not unfamiliar with prison in general and with being on the wrong side of the police for various reasons. And I mean, sometimes it was because family was doing some questionable shit. I'm not going to lie. I even have some people in my family who I don't know how I would handle them, but I don't think they should be trusting around most people. But at the same time, I've had people who have been wonderful people in my life who have been in and out of prison for various reasons. And I've seen that cycle that happens, you know, growing up. I mean, my instead of ever getting help for his alcoholism, my stepdad was constantly just dealing with the police instead of, you know, same thing with my mom, like to a lesser extent. And like when my uncle, you know, went to prison and I, you know, I believe it was for like guns and drugs and stuff. And it's like, okay, but what was he actually doing that was harming people? How can we address the harm that he did if he did it? And, you know, as far as I can tell, his issue was addiction and having some guns and I think a license plate. <laughs> um, you know, if I remember correctly, I could be completely wrong. But like, you know, I, I grew up seeing my uncle. I mean, my uncle boosted cars for a living. Damn. You know, my, and, you know, off of used car lots and stuff. And, and, you know, he very much didn't steal from people if he could help it. And he always could help it, except one time when he accidentally stole the owner of a used car lot's car. And uh, that's the story of how my mom got her Thanksgiving turkey plate. It was in the back of that car. Um, I helped chop up that car, by the way. Wow. <laughs> um, I didn't know at the time. I found out years later that that car I helped chop up was stolen. But yeah, no, the... Uh, I mean, the guy who did it is dead, so it's not like you can get me on anything. I was under 18 and didn't know. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so there's a lot of fun stuff. And don't get me wrong, my family's amazing, you know. I don't think a lot of their run-ins with the laws with the law was for different reasons that could have been addressed in other ways. And some of it was complete bullshit. But seeing family in and out of prison and seeing family dealing with police, always viewing police as people to be scared and skeptical of growing up. And I mean, the only time I got excited about police is when I would hear the sirens leading the parades during Mardi Gras, you know, and like that's the only time I could think looking back at my life that I got excited every other time I was scared or nervous. And looking back, you know, my interactions with police were overwhelmingly negative. Getting blamed for doing graffiti on the back of a gas station at one point and getting, you know, threatened to be tased by a cop who slapped my honey bun across the parking lot because I refused to put it down on the dirty concrete. 
because she thought I did some graffiti that was done three days ago, apparently. Three days before that, you know. Or, you know, being a little kid and being put in the back of a police car for stealing a bag of chips, you know, and being traumatized by that. You know, just different little things. I just never really had a good view. And then what really got me going on prison abolition issues specifically was being part of the industrial workers of the world. I mean, being in the IWW, I definitely love a lot of the work they do, but I'm a freelancer. I'm working for an anarchist think tank. Like, I don't have shit to organize as far as my workplace. I am part of the freelancers union and like I help out with that stuff when I can. And I'm helping out with the freelance journalist union and trying to get more involved with them and which is an IWW branch um, or in one of the industrial unions. But no, like I love the IWW, but they often get accused by a lot of anar- uh, uh, even a lot of other anarchists and leftists of uh, being LARPers because they don't usually have a lot of workplace campaigns going on and they're usually harkening back to the good old days of when labor organizing was especially anarchist syndicalist style labor organizing was more at its peak in america and don't get me wrong like sure there's some element of that but there's a lot of people who are dedicated to stuff and we have the burgerville campaign going on you know they have the starbucks campaign the jimmy johns campaign things like that that were going on you know they do a lot of support work for other stuff they've inspired other Alt labor organizations such as the Coalition of Mobley Workers and our Walmart has we've done a lot of stuff with them. Like there's a lot of overlap between, you know, we're seeing a growing grassroots movement of rank and file union members ignoring their union leadership in favor of what they see as more important. And we really encourage that. And so looking for a campaign to get involved in, what I think really re-energized the IWW in recent years is IWOC, the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. And that is our inmate workers uh, industrial union. Just like we have the, you know, freelance journalist union, like I was talking about, you know, which I think is IU 450. And then we have the Sex Workers Union, um, which is IU 690, which I really love the 69 joke. Nice. Uh, right? But, <laughs> but yeah, there's IWOC, which is our Industrial Workers Organizing Committee, which we allow free membership to inmate workers because we understand the issue with money in general. Even though we do have some minimum dues at $6, we don't expect people in prison to... We don't want them to pay that. We want them to pay whatever they have towards what their needs are. And also, we give them free membership. And the thing is, is most of the time, not just workers, but they're forced to work. You know, I mean, I don't know... If you or your audience has watched, you know, 13th or read The New Jim Crow by Melissa Alexander or, you know, anything along those lines. But our prison system is a system of of slave labor. Legally. Yeah. The 13th Amendment rerouted chattel slavery to prison slavery. It says right in it that slavery is illegal except in cases where you're charged of a crime, which means that at that point you could be legally enslaved and some states you don't have to be paid. Some states do have a minimum wage for prisoners, but it's usually less than a dollar if you're lucky, you know? And so it's like you're not making shit and then you have to pay exorbitant fees. They price gouge in commissary. You know, you, you still have to pay for your health care. Like, you have to pay exorbitant fees for your phone calls. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. But they arrest people for increasingly petty crimes to get free labor. Yep. And it's a corporate subsidy. Right. 
You know, and it's the biggest one in this fucking country. <laughs> like, and we don't really talk about it enough in libertarian circles. It's a huge issue in anarchist circles otherwise. But, you know, other than talking about David Freeman, you don't hear it in libertarian circles. Like, unless it's John Stossel talking about, you know, Blackwater running our military and... And, and how great that would be. Yeah, and and... <laughs> whatever private defense forces that he wants running our police yeah domination is 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 completely fine as long as it's done privately yeah <laughs> god and and honestly i will never even understand the freeman version of that he, he's very much on the free markets private justice system of you know competing agencies fulfilling different you know justice services that's a lot more coherent than uh blackwater <laughs> becoming the military or whatever oh don't get me wrong <laughs> i mean i think freeman's you know ideas are a step in the right direction but i still think they have issues in that you know we've seen private companies be incentivized to hype up threats or even create threats in order to sell you security it's just how markets are incentivized hmm. do you think that through competition though that those bad tendencies would be weeded out since people value protection that's honest i mean yeah to a certain degree that people do you know i think between that and unions and consumer advocacy groups and just you know consumer boycotts and protests and other things like yeah i think there are ways to keep these in check i mean you do see things like you know different private defense agencies having a much better track record as far as enforcing you know crime prevention without you know anywhere near the same level of violence practically you know non-violent comparatively like you're barely seeing private security get into major altercations and i don't know like they have a point when they talk about private defense operating better but then you have examples like the pinkertons where corporations are hiring private security to you know, mow down union organizers with firearms. And I mean, that actually happened. Like, it's hard not to recognize that very dark side of it and how that could be exploited and how that could be a thing. And so I, I, I tend to look for ways that operate around that with the criminal justice system as it exists what's the most immediately necessary reform that needs to take place in your opinion abolish prisons <laughs> you said earlier that some of your family members you don't trust them around random people a lot of fear that people have with abolishing prisons is that you know, people who murder or, or are, are sexual predators, their their harm is curbed by being locked up. And so it, it scares them when they hear prison abolition. What would be your, your response to, to someone who thinks that way? Oh, I, I, I mean, I completely agree with that sentiment. I understand it. Like, I don't want rapists and murderers roaming our streets, especially not being given badges and guns and immunity by the government and told to go enforce the laws against other people. Damn. So it it's kind of hard to give a definite answer admittedly on how we deal with these type of subjects i think it depends on a case-by-case -case basis with the restorative justice approach and i think angela davis you know who really developed a lot of prison abolitionist theory talked about the need to look beyond prisons you know just to get into my family issues like unfortunately you know when and content warning y'all like my i have i've had some family who was messed around with kids and you know there's no way i could justify that i haven't talked to them since 
And in some ways, like in my most, you know, vengeful, spiteful moments, I'm like, yeah, it's good they're in prison. At the same time, like they should be getting therapy. They should be getting help and actually, you know, we should be providing justice based on the needs of the victims rather than just this retributive, like automatic punishment for the perpetrator, which I'm not saying don't hold them accountable. No, absolutely hold them accountable. I'm saying that most of the time we ignore the survivors Mm -hmm. and the process. Other than helping establish guilt, we tend to ignore their needs. Mm -hmm. You know, what about their need for therapy and the costs that come with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, at that point, you know, those people, the perpetrator needs to pay for that cost, you know, needs to help find that therapist, needs to, you know, like there are things that can be done and actually work to transform both the survivors and the perpetrators. And as far as murderers, I mean, that's harder, but, you know, you look at, you know, other models and stuff. I mean, granted, now we're getting the semantics of what is a prison, but I mean, like, the model that you see in Nordic countries where like people are on, you know, the worst of the worst are sent to like an island where they all live in a house or where they all live in their own little houses and like can lock the doors and don't uh, and lock the guards out and like have autonomy and stuff. They just can't leave the island unless they, you know, show decent behavior. Yeah. Have like 30 year maximum sentences have like, significantly lower recidivism rates as compared to the United States. Like, the, you know, you look at some of these places and they look like luxury, you know, but, and we're, you know, I don't think you or anyone who is interested in prison abolition stands this model, but if you compare what they're doing with what the United States is doing, it's easy to see how you might go about doing it differently. That would come closer to justice. I forget which documentary, but it was amazing watching this interview where they talked about this murderer who had chopped up several people with a chainsaw. And as part of his rehabilitation when he was on this island, like they gave him a chainsaw and had him go cut down trees and stuff for their needs on the island and for, you know, other, whatever other needs. And you know, that was a way for him to get out his aggression and channel stuff. And like, that is, wow. That is not something you would even think about in America. Mm -mm. And it seemed to be successful. That's a, that's an interesting anecdote, you know, and as usual, you go beyond reformism with these things, right? Just like with, you know, what we were discussing other earlier, you believe that we have a role in bringing about a a more just system when it comes to these things. And in fact, you gave a speech related to this very topic at uh, an online anarchist or the uh, anarchist book fair that was online not that long ago, to my knowledge. What was your speech all about? What was it called? And could you just explain to the audience everything you touched on with that? Yeah, it was for the NYC anarchist book fair. And, um, they asked uh, Center for State for Society to table, and they asked if anyone at C4SS wanted to host a panel. And so I decided to do one based off my series, Don't Call the Pigs. It's just a popular topic right now. And I thought it was a good topic to cover, especially since my goal with that whole essay series was like to not not prescribe what I think is best because I'm not really that type of anarchist, but more, I mean, I guess I did in that I largely gave less time and credit to just the general private agencies will do it better. Like I looked at other anarchist projects going on beyond that. Um, But other than that, I mean, I didn't really prescribe what was going to become as far as like what is the end goal in the building of an anarchist justice system but i just looked at the projects that were already happening within 
all these different areas, looking at, you know, the prisons, the courts, and the police, and looking at how we can both slowly abolish the current setup and build alternatives. And just looking at the projects that are already doing that to some degree. What are, th- what are some of those? In terms of police, you're looking at things like, you know, cop watch and know your rights trainings. And, you know, the defund the police movement is the biggest one. These type of movements that really push towards it. And as far as alternatives, you got stuff like Cell 411, which is an amazing app which you can set up your own cells that can act as alternatives to calling the police. You know, you call your neighbors and your friends and your family instead, you know, or a trusted defense agency or whatever, you know, like it's awesome. Um, You know, as far as courts, it's things like participatory defense, jury nullification, you know, looking towards like arbitration services and restorative and transformative justice um ideas and you know accountability processes and things like that it's union organizing within prisons and organizing strikes and other inmate actions it is you know writing to inmates sending books to inmates it's all these amazing things all right Back to market anarchism as it relates to this. There's an old saying that says, it's better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent. Would this adage apply to a market anarchist society? I mean, it depends on the individual society. I mean, as Kevin Carson has talked about, markets operate on whatever, you know, ethical framework that you establish in a particular society. And so, you know, I'm not mischaracterizing his viewpoint on that altogether. But I think that in like a David Freemanite, you know, or just like ANCAP style free market justice system in general, yeah, that can be a thing, which is why I look towards non-market solutions for a lot of that. You know, I look towards things like self-defense and community defense initiatives, like, you know, like the militia movement, but not not like a lot of America, unfortunately, because they've taken in a weird direction. But things like, you know, the Zapatistas and, you know, a lot of the people's defense movements and Rojava and, you know, different groups like that, groups like Redneck Revolt and, and Pink Pistols. Coalition of Organized Labor, Socialist Rifle Association, Armed Quality, like those type of groups that provide defense for community events. You know, those are things that we can actually focus on. Other than joining existing organizations that play a role in creating a more just justice system, if you will, what should anarchists be doing right now to, to further that idea? Well, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're joining in on what's already established in your area, or at least network with them if you can't join. Like, you know, there's certain groups like National Lawyers Guild, which like, you're not a law student or a lawyer, you're not going to be able to join, but you might, you might be able to go to one of their trainings and, you know, actually monitor protests on their behalf. And that, you know, you see those people with the bright yellowish green, you know, almost greenish, but like yellowish hats at protests and stuff. And those are NLG folks. Or or if you have a fully informed jury association chapter, like go pass out flyers with them. Like you have a local IWOC chapter, join that, write letters and get involved in a lot of the prison strike protests. Do whatever you can. And then if you really want to progress that further, connect the groups that are already in your area, make sure they're working together to whatever degree you can get them to, and then start to fill in the gaps and create other groups. You know, ones that target situations and and aspects of the entire topic that aren't covered in your area as well right cool 
Um, all right, so towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Yeah, sure. All right, the first on the list is Pope Francis. Um, I mean, I definitely think that he is pushing Catholicism in a better direction and bringing it back to its actual biblical roots as far as environmentalism, as far as anti-capitalism and those things. He's definitely got some problematic views on trans and queer issues at times. But I mean, since when, you know, Catholics not. Um, (laughs) But I mean, you know, I definitely think that he is doing a lot of good for the church. And I'm very, very happy that he is doing what he's doing for the most part. And I should be releasing a uh, analysis of his last encyclical at some point. The occult. Um, depends on what you mean by that. If you mean hidden knowledge, I mean, sure, I guess it exists. Um, but it, that same mindset very much reminds me of the conspiracy mindset, which I mean, don't get me wrong, there are conspiracies, but I'm going to, you know, more go with what I could know in tests and that type of thing, even when I do have views otherwise sometimes. But I mean, I get into hoodoo sometimes, being when I come from Louisiana, but I don't really consider that a cult. That's more just kitchen witch stuff, working with herbs and healing people and you know, helping people with everyday means. Solar punk. I'm a nerd. My dad owned a comic shop growing up and raised me on anime and shit. My grandma was a sci-fi, like my grandma is a sci-fi nerd and a, you know, horror nerd. She's that type of fan girl. So having a topic that crosses the loop between my political interests And my interest in science fiction, I mean, I've attended a solar punk panel at Megacon one year, and it was absolutely amazing. And I mean, yes, it was a little bit more liberal than I wanted at times. And uh, they very much were praising Elon Musk for some reason. But it was really cool to see a place where I could at least mention Murray Bookchin's name at a a sci-fi convention. And I really appreciate that space. And I think any ways that we can connect various groups like that and outreach to various groups like that is amazing. And I think the aesthetic is amazing. And I think that the goals are amazing of it because who the hell doesn't like amazing technology and social ecology and just environmentalism? Militia movements. Uh, it depends on what you mean. I think a lot of the militia movement in America is very right wing, unfortunately. And, you know, that's not always a bad thing when it's traditional conservatives, you know, that very much are more on the agrarian, you know, mindset. But when you get to a lot of the movements in this country, I mean, it's based on like Waco and Ruby Ridge and a lot of the. Christian identity movement and white supremacist movements. And, you know, I mean, Ruby Ridge, the Weavers were white supremacists. It definitely is a dangerous concoction. You have a lot of white supremacist infiltration. Some of the members can be reached out to, though. And groups like Coalition of Armed Labor and other groups have, you know, reached out to various different, you know, right-wing militia groups and things like that and had some success and uh, uh, at least turning their guns away from the most marginalized people in society and teaching them that, like, Black Lives Matter and Antifa are not the real enemies. The Constitution of the United States. Uh, Just as bogus as any other government document. I like it in as much as the best of its ideas are based off the ideas of the Iroquois Confederacy, and I really admire that aspect. I think outside of that, it is a racist colonialist document that is outdated as shit if it ever was appropriate. And uh, I don't really see it. I mean, yeah, fight and use the Bill of Rights and stuff to our advantage, but I don't really see it as anything useful or anything to strive to maintain. Okay, so before we go to the actual end of our conversation, I wanted to ask you some listener questions, and then we'll be finished. 
The first listener question is about your article on bullshit jobs and the ludic revolution. What is the most important cause we should be working on to bring about the ludic revolution, or said differently, to end bullshit jobs and toil? Ludic revolution. I really like that phrase, and I don't think I've ever used it, but I definitely love it. As far as ending bullshit jobs, I mean... I don't think it's a perfect solution, but it's one that David Graeber himself, when talking about the problem, proposes a solution. And it's one that the author of Fully Automated Luxury Communism also, also agrees with is universal basic income. I mean, I wrote a defense for it from an anarchist perspective. I think that it eventually needs to be phased out or privatized in some way. But I, you know, definitely see it as something that is useful in the meantime for giving labor more power and for giving us more time and power and resources to fight against the state and corporate power. So this next one is also about an article that you wrote called Anarchism for a Mainstream Audience. It's there you point out that AA... Alcoholics Anonymous is clearly influenced by anarchism, yet they never use the term, probably to the credit of the organizers of AA and the ability of the 12 Steps program to get mainstream acceptance. Should anarchists focus less on the label and more on just acting out our beliefs to have the most success in changing the world? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I never thought labels were hugely important. I think actions are way more important. That's why I really don't limit myself based on labels as far as who I'm going to organize with. I organize with people who want to work on issues and are serious about it. I am here to actually change shit. And, you know, you'll find a lot in common between you know, anti-government conservatives, you know, small government conservatives and anti-authoritarian leftists when you look at it. You know, you'll find a lot in common with ANCAPs and and the rest of anarchists. Um, You'll find a lot in common with Marxists and the rest of anti-capitalists and Bernie Kratz. And, you know, like, we're never going to agree on everything, but reach out and work with people. And um, spread the ideas over the labels. It doesn't really matter the labels at the end of the day if you're out there actually creating change. The point is to save lives and to create a more just world. Mm. Too many people are dying and too many too many things are at risk to worry about labels and infighting. Do you think American anarchists should take inspiration from democratic confederalism And should the Kurdish model be replicated in the States? Um, To some degree. I mean, I know that it has gained a lot of popularity. Of course, the model that they're using right now is not fully anarchist. It is definitely libertarian. But, you know, they have council governments, things like that. But I think it's a step in the right direction. And I can see it working on a municipal, local level, especially if you, you know, combine it with a lot of the state's rights, localist kind of, you know, conservative libertarian bend in that respect. But then also, you know, very much look towards, you know, local municipal control. And I, and I just mean like not only through electoralism with like maybe the DSA or groups like that, but also through, Um, you know, local community councils and things like that that are separate from the state and organizations like that, you know, very much in a libertarian municipalist style. So, I mean, I think that could be appropriate and could work. It would have to take a slightly different form than Rojava, but I think any tactic's got to take a different form depending on where it's at. So the last listener question is, how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Make it yourself or go to the damn cafe and order one. I don't know. <laughs> and it'll probably be... Okay, so... so Sorry, no. <laughs> you have to... Let's see, I'm a libertarian socialist, so 
you have to order it through the central committee of the collective of the cooperative. Um, we <laughs> vote on whether or not you get it. <laughs> we take the resources, you buy it in Bitcoin, <laughs> and then we send it to you via drone. <laughs> but no, real answer is it would probably just be, you know, sustainably harvest coffee. And like Peter said before, like if it's not available in your area because it's not environmentally feasible to really do it sustainably, then tough shit. <laughs> there are other alternatives, believe it or not, but it does suck as a fact of life. But yeah, I mean, hopefully locally sustainably harvest and, you know, more expensive uh, imports where possible. And, you know, cooperative coffee shops and more at home brewing. All right. So where should folks go to follow you and your work? Um, I mean, definitely you can always check out c4ss.org. All my main writings are there and republished elsewhere. Um, there's greenmarketagorist.wordpress.com. And that has links to my YouTube account, which is currently silent due to legal stuff right now, but will be active later on. You can catch all my other video content over at Bitch Shoot. And, you know, it also have links to my podcast on Anchor and Spotify, um, links to, you know, all the ways you can support me via, you know, donations and affiliate and affiliate links and such. And agorafest.wordpress.com for the festival. What are some other resources or websites or organizations you think people should plug into to learn more about your political convictions? I don't know. C4SS.org. It's going down.org. Agorism.info. I don't know. There's a bunch of different cool stuff. And is there anything I forgot to ask you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? No. Just donate to my page or donate to my legal fundraiser. Yep. I would like to, to second that. I can't thank you enough for, for joining me, Logan Marie Glitterbaum. It's been a pleasure. Why, well, thank you so much. Of course. We'll talk to you soon. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviamedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.